Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Acts chapter 20. Uh, we're going to be picking up where we left off. If you remember, you're going to have to remember all the way back to uh, July 31st. I've been on vacation, and the person who was supposed to continue the preaching in Acts got COVID. So Norman, as you know, stepped in last minute. He just printed off a sermon from sermon.com. And, no, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Norman served a long time. Yeah, Norman has been serving in the ministry for a long time and thankfully had one uh, available that he could adapt for our church. So uh, again, thank you so much, Norman, for that. But July 31st, we were in Acts 19 and we talked about Paul's time in Ephesus and the riot that ensued while he was there because of his bold message of preaching the gospel in Ephesus. And if you remember, all the prophets of the uh, uh, of the shopkeepers were dwindling because so many people people were coming to faith in Jesus, that they no longer needed their idols for security and to worship because they were worshiping the one true and living God. So they all got mad, this big riot, they uh, got pulled into the hall and and they're yelling and screaming. And this is where we're following up from right on the heels of that. So if you have your Bibles, let's start reading in verse 1 of Acts 20. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent out for disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece, and there he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopter the Berean, son of Prius, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychius, and Trophimus. These went all ahead of him and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Days. So verse 1 to 6 is kind of just a travel log, log, uh, log for us. Right after the riots, things calm down. They, uh, Paul jumps on and he crosses the Aegean Sea to Macedonia. He begins to encourage some tr- struggling churches there. And then he continues down to Greece and he does the same. And his intent is actually to get back to Jerusalem, if you remember, before heading to Rome. And he's collecting an offering from all these churches to bring to the Jerusalem church, the mother church. But then he learns about a plot against his life. So Paul Paul, using wisdom, he didn't just run headlong into persecution, he uh, takes a detour, it kind of tricks them, and he goes back up, and he ends up heading to Troas. And the city, this city was where he was several years ago, if you remember, when he had that vision or that dream of a man from Macedonia bidding him to come and help them. Troas was adjacent to the ancient city of Troy. There was a peaceful setting when Paul arrived, and you could just be sure that there was probably a joyous reunion, uh, because when we talk about splitting up and travel, we're saying hours or maybe days, but when they would split up to travel, it could be weeks, months, and maybe even years. So their reunion was sweet, and then they engaged in ministry for a few days with Paul as their leader, which brings us to the part of Scripture that I want us to focus on today, which is verses 7 to 12. So let's continue reading verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to, the break, to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. I'm not preaching till midnight today, don't worry. And there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered. So just a a couple Bible connections for you as you read through the New Testament. Scholars uh, believe we can pinpoint which house they were actually meeting at that night because Paul in his final letter that he was writing from jail in Rome, 2 Timothy, he says in uh, chapter 4, verse 13, he says to Timothy, can you go uh, and stop at Troas and pick up the robe that I've forgotten at Cyprus' house? So Acts 20 probably took place in the upper chambers of Cyprus' house in a spacious three uh, story uh, house and uh, because he, if you remember reading just a couple seconds ago, he was intending to leave right at daybreak. He didn't stop anywhere else. So it's likely this is where it's happening. And this event took place on a Sunday. Notice that he says on the Lord's day, which is the day of the resurrection when Jesus rose from the dead, not the Sabbath day. This isn't a mistake on Paul's behalf. He's a faithful Jew. He would have known to call Saturday 
the Sabbath day, but yet he's talking about the Lord's Day Sunday. And this is one of the earliest references in Scripture that we see them having set apart Sunday as their day of worship. And now we follow in that same tradition. And as we notice in verse 7, there are two things that this early church prioritized when they came together. And we should pay attention to this as a church. Because if we don't do any of these things, that might be an issue. One thing they prioritized when coming together was they broke bread. They took the Lord's Supper. And they did this because Jesus had commanded them to do it. And we also see when they came together, they put a high priority on the word of God, an emphasis on the preaching and teaching of scripture. They sat there all night with Paul listening to him teach. And we, not sitting all night, but we also put a high emphasis on the preached word of God here at Fellowship Baptist Church. But because they were meeting on Sunday, there was no, it's not like the 21st century where they had all these religious rites and they could get out of work or whatnot. They were likely finishing their work day. This service probably started in the evening after their works and they just completed a long day in the hot sun and they came together for a common meal, a a commemoration of the death of Jesus. And it was probably a larger gathering than normal because Paul was here and he's only here for a couple of hours and he has chosen to teach. So it probably just drew a massive crowd to come into this church. Everyone was there. And Paul, he was an experienced communicator. He knew how to keep the cookies on the bottom shelf, right? He knew how to feed the sheep and he also knew how to feed the giraffe at the same time. And he knew that the mind could only absorb as much as the seat allowed. As John Newton said, when weariness begins, edification ends, right? But Paul, he had so much to share on this particular sun, uh, Sunday gathering. He was, it was his first contact with this infant church since he's been there before, and possibly his last ever in his life. And with the rising of the sun, Paul was gone. He would be leaving. So he could not bring himself to conclude his sermon. And besides, nobody was complaining. Nobody was looking at their sundials on their wrist and going, okay, let's get out of here, right? They weren't complaining, so he didn't stop. So let's just use our imagination for a moment. Picture this. They're crowded in to a, 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 a house, right to the walls. They're, they're, we're going to see that they're sitting in windows. You know, whoever came up with that uh, statistic and started believing that a church only grows 80% of their capacity, well, come on, we're not hanging out of windows yet, right? So uh, when the Spirit of God moves, he moves, amen? So these guys are in this little building. They're packed to the walls. It's hot, and they've chosen to meet in the upper room. You got to remember that this was on the corner of the Mediterranean Sea. It was probably hot and stuffy. And they also had torches on the walls, right? With fire going. Imagine if I turn the AC off this Sunday. We're sitting in here at plus 30 degrees and I put fire on our walls for light. And so it's not only just heating us up, but it's stealing all of our oxygen. And that's what we see happening here in this church. Uh, Nature soon presents itself And uh, drowsiness kicks in, and we see what happens in verse 9, if you have your Bibles. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. I love that. He just kept going. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. The tenses in the Greek portray that poor Eutychus was being gradually overcome by sleep. And at the same word for sleep here is where we get our word hypnosis, right? He was hypnotized in a sense. He was falling asleep. You could just picture it. His head's bobbling. He's, oh, oh, it was a long day at work. Stay awake, Eutychus. You got this. And he just kept bobbing and bobbing. And then soon the stifling room and the, and the hypnotic flicker of the flames did its job. And poor Eutychus was overcome by sleep. He closed his eyes and fell headlong into the pavement below. And the most iconic part of this, which I just find funny, and you can call me sadistic if you want, is that his name means fortunate. Eutychus means fortunate. Well, he wasn't too fortunate here, but he would be roused from the dead, and it wouldn't be fortune that was his savior. It would be the providence of God working through Paul. Verse 10 says, But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. 
What's amazing is that after all this commotion, after all, you could just picture the church gasping as he falls out of the window and rushing down to grab him. And after all of this and Paul raising from the dead, Paul didn't go, you know what? Let's just put a pin in this. We'll end it. No, he brings their attention right back to Jesus. He goes back up. And and, and as we see in verse 11, they break the bread and take communion. And Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten. And he conversed with them a long while until daybreak. And so he departed. And, And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. But I feel sorry for poor Eutychus. First, because he fell asleep on the Apostle Paul. That's kind of embarrassing. Second, because he fell out of a window and died. He rose again. That's pretty good. But also because Luke, just being Luke, I I feel like I'd be Luke. I'm going to record this so everyone for thousands of years remembers the first person to fall asleep in church. (laughs) But what I want you to notice is not the fact that Eutychus showed up, or sorry, fell asleep. Is that the fact that Eutychus showed up? He came. He was likely tired and worn out. Maybe he even debated after his uh, shift ended at his work. Should I even go? I'm so tired. I, I have nothing left to give. And that's what we should find noteworthy. Is that Eutychus was a young believer likely, wanting to grow. He was present in the moment. And I can't help but begin to ask myself this question and encourage you to ask yourself, have you ever been at a moment in your spiritual journey where you have just felt so defeated? Where have you just felt so discouraged? Where have you just been falling in the stupor of the rhythm and routine of whatever you find yourself in? And you're just, why? I have nothing to give. All I can do is just come and sit in this chair. And that's okay. I would encourage you, and from what we're going to see in Eutychus, that sometimes just showing up will position you to watch God do something grand in your life. We all go through seasons of this. We all go through spiritual dry times. This is normal as Christians. But the worst thing you could do when you go through this is isolate yourself. To pull away and to hide and to never show up again. And to, to, re, to remain away from the community that God has put you in. So I wanted to just draw that out for you to bring some encouragement to any of you who are here who are, who are tired who are heavy laden, who are weary. Maybe you've argued with yourself even this morning. The kids were going nuts and you're like, "Ah, should I even go? Should I even bother going? They don't even have kids ministry in the summer. I have to sit with these little devils throughout the whole service too. Are you kidding me? And maybe you argued with yourself, but I'm so glad you came because we are in the midst of God as we gather together as his church. We are in the midst of the God whose burden is light and whose yoke is easy and who is bidding you to come and rest and hear him. But there's also some warnings I want to draw out for us as Christians as well, and that's the danger of falling asleep in church. I, as a pastor, and also growing up in the church my whole life, have seen many people fall asleep in church. Some of them here, they, you know, they think they're being sneaky, they'll cross their arms and try to look meditative, but I know they're checked out. Right? <laughs> Others of you, you're not so subtle, you're just clonking away back there, and I'm like, wow, either the Holy Spirit's got them or they're passed out, I don't know what's happening. But I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and, uh, and my stream of Pentecostalism was the weird one, but uh, it, was, uh, it was normal to just lay out flat on the front of the church and pray, and they would come and lay a blanket on you too so you didn't expose yourself to anyone. And, uh, and I was like, well, I could capitalize on this as a teen. So I'd, like, I'd go pray, and I'd just lay down, get one of those little cloths, and I'd just check out for the 30 and 40 minutes that left of service, and I turned out somewhat okay. But, uh, you know, and I've also been to a church in Toronto where I've seen the ushers, they've had these big poles with tennis balls on the ends of them, and they push people's heads back up. I give you permission, if I ever present that as an idea, just fire me. I'm done. I I have fallen asleep at the wheel at that point. But I have great sympathy for people who fall asleep in church. I really do. Some of you in, uh, are working really long schedules, shift work, and, uh, or your kids have kept you up all night, and the first time you get to relax is when you sit in these chairs and you check out. Some of you are victims of heavy medication, and that's okay. Sometimes you're just so warm. You're sitting next to so many people in this church, it's just warm. But the fact is that some of the greatest saints in church history have fallen asleep in services. And Eutychus was perhaps an enthusiastic young Christian, and he was just tired. And he didn't want to miss church for anything. His spirit was willing, but his body was sleepy. 
And falling asleep in church is not the concern of this message. I don't, I'm not concerned if you check out, go ahead, you'll just get it kind of like through osmosis maybe. You know, just whatever, fall asleep. What I'm concerned about today is the thousands of people who warm chairs and pews across our country who are physically awake but are spiritually asleep. They are just casual Christians. They don't truly know the living God. They are just going through religious motion after religious motion after religious motion, checking off the boxes. I did church today. I'm a good Canadian Christian. And there's innumerable churchgoers who appear awake but are fatally asleep. So my concern is not if you're falling asleep physically in this church. It's if you're at this church and you're in a spiritual slumber. Are you spiritually awake or are you asleep? Are your hearts set aflame for Christ by his doing or are they as cold as ice? Some of you are like Eutychus. You're hungry to grow, but you're just drained from the pressures of life. And again, that's not my concern. What I tell you is the same encouragement. Come and rest. Show up. But what I'm focused on is the spiritually asleep, the ones who play lip service in this church week after week, but their hearts are far from God. And this leads us all to a question of why are people asleep in church or in their spiritual walk? Some people are asleep because they have never been awake to begin with. I'm familiar with this state because this was the state that I was in. I went to church. I was raised in a good Christian home. We read the Bible every single day as a family after church. We went through catechism questions, and I knew everything, but yet I didn't know the living God. I had no comprehension of his saving work. I was just with other people as they worship God. I was an outsider. And perhaps that's you. Maybe you derive some vague comfort of just being with religious people and doing religious things, but inside you understand very little of what's going on. And I pity this because it's possible to pass from this life and into the next without recognizing your slumber until it's too late. It's possible to be damned as you even sit in church every single Sunday. As Screwtape, a senior devil, said to his trainee Wormwood in the great C.S. Lewis novel, Screwtape Letters, he said the safest road to hell is a gradual one, a gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, and without signposts, without any warning. Is that you? Have you been truly awake? Have you been born again by the living God? Because if you have not been born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again. You must turn to Christ. You must have your heart of stone and turn to a heart of flesh. Your eyes, your veils must be removed and you must see spiritual things. That's not your doing, but that's the doing of God. You must be born again. Another reason why people are spiritually asleep is because of sin or a compromised, backslidden state. Some people have experienced a true awakening. Some people have been born again and are true Christians, but have slipped spiritually into a comatose state. They're just checked out. Sometimes we hear of Christians who have sunk and fallen to unimaginable depths, although they were at church every Sunday, although they led a Bible study, although they were a pastor. And they've sunk to un, un, unimaginable depths. They seemed like they were listening, but they were spiritually asleep. And Samson is the preeminent example of this in Scripture. He started off in the faith and he ended in the faith, but in between those two signposts, he messed up greatly, big time. Sin progressively took a hold of him, and he was no longer awake to spiritual realities. In fact, his final doze on Delilah's lap was symbolic of his state. It says in Judges 16.20, and, and she said, Delilah, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as other times, because remember, this is like the third time this has happened, and I'll shake myself free. But he did not know, he did not know that the Lord left him. Sin desensitizes us, and we soon fall asleep, even in church. Though externally everything looks good, everything looks prim and proper, but sin makes us indifferent and even bored with spiritual things. Which brings me to the third one, which is familiarity. 
is the third reason why uh, some are in a spiritual slumber. C.S. Lewis again, not to quote him twice, but recognized this danger and he, as he warned a friend who was talking to him about joining the ministry, becoming a minister, and he said the constant familiar uh, uh, with holy things could dull him of their significance. He summed it up in his book. He says, none are so unholy as those whose hands are catarized with holy things. Becoming familiar can sometimes be a danger. Maybe you were like me and you were raised in church and, and, and you knew all these spiritual things and we can easily become like a person who works at a sales booth in an airport who sells tickets to all these different destinations and then they start to, to travel vicariously through people although they have never traveled at all. And they start believing, yeah, I've been to all these places, but yet they have never left the booth. They've just sold tickets. And we can easily become like that. We've learned, some of us have learned hymns in the doxology long before we even knew our times tables. We have been through all the motions of church and we become so familiar with it that we lose the wonder that it should hold in our hearts. Our worship begins to become dull. We become bored in church, which should be an oxymoron. Forgetting that we are standing in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But we forget this because we've become so apathetic. So the most logical question that we should have is how do we stay awake in church? Or better yet, how do we stay awake on our spiritual journey? Each of us should periodically make personal assessment if we have ever truly been awake. And we should ask God, the God of grace, to help us believe. We must confess our sins, declare our faith in Christ, and ask Christ to make us brand new, to receive him as our Savior. And then church, spiritual things, reading your Bible will become more alive than ever imagined. And if you're here and you're already a child of God, but your sleeping state is due to sin in your lives, you must repent. You must be reconciled with God. It must do a U-turn and allow the joy of Christ to refill you and watch the joy of worship come rushing and flooding your soul. And those who suffer from the problem of familiarity, this is the hard one. This is the hard one. We must deliberately, when we suffer in these times, we all go through it. We must deliberately participate with all we have in the corporate worship of the church, praying and asking God to reignite our passions for the things of God. But it takes work. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying work for your salvation. A lot of us like to take that doctrine and twist it to make it seem like we can just sit in our pews and say, bless me, bless me, Lord, and I get fat on spiritual things and never do anything. No, you must work out your salvation. There must be works that accompany your faith. It's like exercising at the gym. You know, you go in there, and if you're like me, you think you can lift everything a million times, and then you complain to your wife for six weeks after. But uh, you've got to go in there and take it slow and work, and before you know it, you're going to be running faster. You're going to be lifting heavier. You're going to be doing more reps of those exercises, and it's the same thing spiritually. We must practice these things. We must do the work. We must train ourselves and exercise, and before long, we will see our growth. So when we have these moments of familiarity where it's dulling our worship, when we sing songs, we should shut everything out, really focus. Lord, I'm gonna, I, I don't feel like worshiping you, but I know I need to, so I'm going to worship you and shut everything out and not just worship with our mouth, but worship with our hearts and our minds engaged. As others lead us in prayer, as our elders come forward Sunday after Sunday and lead us in prayer, we should be praying with them in spirit, like a spiritual concert. When we hear scripture, Scripture read and preached, we should, be we should be listening like we're hearing the voice of God. Not my words, but these words. We should be listening. We must listen to God's words as it was a love letter. We've all received love letters. We used to pass them in school. And you'd get them from your, your crush and you would hang on every word like, oh, she thinks my ears are cute. And, uh, and you're like, this is so amazing. And you start hanging on every word. And you're like, oh, why did she say it like that? Uh-oh. And you're, and you're examining everything that's being said. That's how you should read the Bible. That's how you should listen to the Bible. Like it's a love letter being written 
to you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer ran a seminary in Nazi Germany that wasn't approved by the state, and he was a critical thinker and a very intelligent man. But in his homiletics class, which was his preaching class, he would put down his grading papers, he would put down his notebooks, and he would just sit there in front of the student with his Bible, very intimidating, and he would listen to them no matter how good or bad they were because he believed that if he was listening to the words of God, God himself. A lot of people complain that they don't hear God, but they're trying to listen to him while their Bibles are closed. This is the word of God. And if you want to hear his audible voice, just read it out loud. Come on, nobody got that joke? Amen. (laughs) If we have been born again from slumber, and if we have confessed our sin, we must cautiously and in dependence on God to wake up to the wonders of worship. Our coming together as believers Sunday after Sunday should demonstrate that we are awake and alive in Christ. Worship should be in technicolor, for Christ is with us. And that's how we stay awake in church. Amen? So let's wake up together. As I close, and I I promise, Scott, I don't plan this for when you come here, but Martin Luther um, had a parable, had a parable or a dream on how one occasion the devil sat upon his throne listening to his demons, his agents, who would report the progress that they had made in opposing the truth of Christ and destroying his followers. And one demon came to him and said, uh, there is a band of Christians who are traveling the desert and I have loose lions on them and the, the sand is stained with the blood of these Christians. And the devil responded to him and said, what of that? Uh, Their their bodies perished, but their souls were saved. I'm after their souls. And then another demon came and said, "There there is a pilgrimage of Christians going across the sea, and I've sent wind against them. Their boat crashed against the rocks, and all the Christian souls on board died. And he's like, what of that? Their bodies drowned, but I'm after their souls. Their souls were saved. And then the third demon came and reported to him that he, for 10 years, he's been trying to, to put a Christian into sleep. And he finally succeeded. And at that, the corridors of hell rang with praise and excitement that finally they had some triumph over a Christian. So if we are asleep, we must wake up. And if you are asleep today for any of those reasons, let's hear the word of God as we go back to worship. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And Ephesians 5, 14. For anything that becomes visible in light, therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. In Christ will shine on you. Let's pray. O oh God, O oh our Father, our Lord, may each of us awake from our sinful slumber and come to life in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then be ever vigilant as we serve you and do your bidding day by day. Help us, Lord, not to become so familiar with your truths and your plans for us that we consider them commonplace or of little consequence. Open our eyes again and again so that the wonders of your love and life will carry us to ever greater spiritual heights. In Jesus' name, amen.